This week's parasha is called Balak, a very interesting parasha that some of the parashot in the Torah, it's a story, which these are the ones that most people like. Some of the parashot are very boring, <coughs> one might say, they are very boring. Just, excuse me? Yeah. All the parashot are not boring, but some people say they're boring. But this parasha, there's a story, there's an interesting story. And usually when there's a story, there's a very deep message behind the story. And in this week's parasha, we find a very, very interesting message that many people wonder why everybody hates us. The whole world hates us. And it's not something new. They always hated us. It's not that we did, did something lately and everybody's upset. From the beginning of time, we were never liked. And we were always hated. And of course, there's many different explanations, but in this week's parasha, there's a certain individual, uh, a prophet, a one-eyed prophet, like a pirate, and he only had one eye. And he, with very bad vision, was able to see into the future and to give us a message 3,300 and plus years ago. He had an unbelievable prophecy that actually is, is, was and is true. And when Bilam was approached by Balak, Balak was a king and the king of Moab, and he saw the nations of Israel approaching his country, and he saw how they went into war with many nations and they destroyed them. He started warring. He's like, I'm next. Now, if they were able to fight Amalek and many other big countries bigger than me, they're going to destroy me. So he started becoming very worried. So he says, okay, how are we going to win them? He started asking around and it happened to be that Moshe Rabbeinu grew up in Midian because when Moshe Rabbeinu ran away from Paro, he went to Midian. So they knew him. So when he asked, what is, this, what is the power of this leader? Why is he so powerful? Then they told him his power is in his mouth. He has a very powerful mouth. And if you want to win him, you need somebody that knows how to overpower him with his mouth. So they went to Bilam. Bilam was a very big prophet. And <clears throat> he told them, yeah, you can win them. You can fight them. And he thought he can maybe win them with cursing them. When Bilam saw he cannot curse the Jews, so he says, listen, I'm very sorry to tell you. I'm here standing on the mountain looking at them and I can't even curse them because their God is protecting them in such a way that I, can, I can't even curse them. Later on he gave him a solution. He saw that he can't do the job. He just told them, listen, just uh, take a few young girls, send, the, send them over, they'll do the job. A big prophet like Bilam couldn't do the job, so he said, just send a few young teenager, two teenager girls and all the young girls to seduce the, the to their men, they'll make them fail. And that's really what happened at the end. But Bilam, when he saw he can't curse, he, he literally said, their God is protecting them. And then he said one sentence, which was a prophecy that obviously was fulfilled. And the prophecy, he said, Hen am levadad yishkon, uvagoim lo et chashav. Basically saying, this nation is going to be by themselves, levadad yishkon. The levadad means bodet, uh, by themselves. Yishkon means they will dwell. Ve'bagoim lo chashav, and the nations are not going to uh, count them as anything. They're not going to see any value to them. And sure enough, after 3,300 and plus years, the prophecy was right. We were always by ourselves. We were always separated from the nations. We're always small in, the, in quantity, but we were always in many different ways separated to a point that we were always hated. Now, on this pasuk, there are two interpretations or commentaries. The first commentary is by the Ramban, 
And he has a harsh commentary. He says this nation is going to be always by themselves. They're going to be lonely. They're going to be prosecuted and chased and hated. They're going to be by themselves. Nobody's ever going to come to their rescue. And not only that, they're going to always have to worry for to themselves. I mean, even now, maybe now, in the last couple of decades, we see some countries are, are on our side. We have some allies that pretended to come to our help when we really needed them. But really, even if you look at history, go 40 years ago to the two big wars that we had, you think somebody came to help us? You think in the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur, or somebody came to help us? Nobody came to do anything. They were from far away saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. My father was a, uh, what, what not was, he is a general. He was in all the arm, uh, wars in Israel. And he told me in Yom, the Yom Kippur War, when we were attacked by four armies, you think somebody came to save us? You think anybody came to help? Even the Americans didn't come to help. Not only did they didn't come to help, they didn't even send us ammunition. We were running out of ammunition. We were literally counting bullets because we didn't have ammunition. And you think somebody came, forget about to fight with us. In uh, the Yom Kippur War, <clears throat> my father was a colonel and operating in the southern part of Israel, fighting Egypt, which was a massive, massive army. And forget about the casualties and, and, and the loss of life. He's like, we didn't have anything. We literally were stuck without ammunition, without nothing. We couldn't even, nobody came to fight. The Russians came and helped the Egyptians to fight. Literally, Russian soldiers were fighting with the Egyptians. We didn't have anybody. And when the, the belt was already choking us to a point that it was, that's it, we're almost losing the war, then the decision was that that's it, we're going to have to use a nuclear bomb. And the second that the security cabinet put on the this table the option, we have no option, we have to use a nuclear bomb, if not we're going to be completely destroyed, then everybody was like, oh, no, 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 don't press the button and we'll help you a little bit. So only when the, 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 the government decided, okay, we have no option but to use nukes, that's when the American government says, okay, don't, don't nuke, he will send you some ammunition. It didn't even come to help, they just said, we'll send you some ammunition. So really, even though we are members of the United Nations, I don't know if you ever noticed, 80% of the votes in the United Nations are against Israel. They're only talking about Israel. They're not talking about the genocide in, in Turkey, in, in the Holocaust in Syria. That nobody's talking about. They're talking about because a policeman arrests a kid that throws stones or because somebody built a veranda in Yerushalayim. So really we, we don't have any friends. The world is pretending to be our friend. But really nobody's our, our allies and nobody's our friend. And I know maybe many will argue by saying you do it to yourself, you make the world hate you. But that's a whole different argument. The point is that this Bilam, who was a huge prophet, gave a prophecy 3,300 and plus years ago that we are going to be uh, a nation that we're always going to be fighting for our survival. Now the Ramban says, yeah, this is uh, what he meant, is we're going to be lonely. Lonely, not that we're going to be uh, uh, by our, uh, necessarily lonely by ourselves, but we're never going to have anybody by our side. We're constantly going to have to take care of ourselves. Nobody will ever come to our rescue, nobody will come to save us, and that's our destiny. To a point, I heard like a very harsh uh, commentary about a certain parasha in the Torah, but it's kind of funny and makes sense that nobody ever cared about us as a nation. And if you remember in Parashat Vaishlach, there was a story when Shimon and Levi, they went to revenge the act that was done to their sister Dina, she was raped. So they went into the city of Shechem and they killed everybody. So there's all sorts of questions, like how did even Yaakov allow such a thing? How would such a thing happen? First of all, there were two little kids, you know, Levi was only 13 years old. And they went in and killed all the, the men in the city. So 
one of the ways how they did that is they circumcised all the men. So they went in and they said, okay, you want to take our sister? No problem, you all have to circumcise yourself. And on the third day when they were all healing, that's when they went into the city and killed everybody. So one might say, okay, it was a tactic to make them weak because they couldn't fight back. So there's an argument on that. Okay, so why circumcise? Tell them fast for a week. Why do you have to circumcise yourself? You want to make them weak? Tell them our condition. You want our sister, our condition, fast for a week. Well, there's many other ways to make them tired. Why circumcise them? So I heard a very uh, <laughs> extreme commentary that said they wanted them to circumcise, them, to circumcise themselves. Why? So they will become Jewish. Now, if they go and kill them, they're killing Jews, so nobody will care. If they won't be Jewish, and they will go in and kill them, then the whole world will come and say, Whoa, whoa, the Jews are doing genocide in the city of Shechem. They're killing non-Jews. Everybody will go against them. So they said, okay, we will make them Jews. And everybody says, they kill Jews. So we let them kill them. It's fine. So when it's killing Jews, the world doesn't care. For four and a half years, everybody knew exactly what's going on in Europe. Nobody dared. Nobody cared. I think the, American, the Americans and the, and the allies, so to say, they didn't know what's going on. They knew exactly what's going on. Nobody really cared. A year after the, the war broke out, they had the option of bombing all the railroads to Auschwitz and, and all these death camps. Nobody bothered to do that. So in the story with Shimon and Levi, they said, if we're going to kill non-Jews, we're going to have an issue now with everybody. Let's make them Jews. Nobody will care. No, we can kill them. So the sad reality is that we're always by ourselves. But there's another commentary on this, pro on this prophecy by Rashi. And he's a little bit more optimistic than Ram, the Ramban. And he says, you know, the word Badad, Badad means by himself. But Badad can also be read as Boded, si single. And Boded has the, the uh, equal to the word Yechid. Yechid is one. And Rashi says, it's not a nation that was always going to be segregated by himself. Rather, this is going to be the only nation that will ever survive. All the other nations will never survive. And Rashi is more right, because there's no nations that ever survived. Not the Egyptians, not the Persians, not the Babylonians, not the Romans. Nobody. Nobody survived. We are the only nation that with holocausts and pogroms and, and, and death, death uh, 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 hovering over our head, this is the only nation that ever survived. This is the, you know, a nation that came out of the Holocaust. So Rashi was right and he says, yeah, not only that we're always going to be by ourselves, but we're going to be the only nation that will ever survive. So really comes a big question, why? Why is everybody hating us? Really? What, we, what did we do? I know we're not such a pleasant nation. I know we have all sorts of, uh, sorts of problems with our ego and we think we're the best. And, and, but why? What, what really, what did we do? And more than that, what is our, our purpose? Our purpose is, one might say, yeah, to fulfill the Torah, do the mitzvot, learn Torah, that's our purpose. But that's not our purpose, because the non-Jews, the nations, also have to follow the Torah and do mitzvot. So what is our, what is, why are we so different? We must have a purpose. We must be doing something here. And this is the parasha that we can find out what it is. Now, unfortunately, the history shows that we all, always had a problem with everybody. And the first anti-Semite in history kind of said, what's our problem? You know, you know who was the first anti-Semite? It was Haman. He was the first one that says, let's destroy this nation. You can't say Paro because we weren't the nation yet. Haman was the first anti-Semite that said, I want to destroy this nation. And you know why I want to destroy this nation? Because their religion is different than all religions. That's what Haman said. That they him shona mikola datot. They, they do different. All the nations, they're kind of similar, their religion. Our religion is different. 
Haman didn't like that. And this is really, really the, the thing that originated the hate, that we were different. All the other nations, they would do certain things the same way, and we did it completely different, and we had all these weird things that nobody ever accepted. And this is where it started, that we were different in our religion. Our religion was different. You know, even the word religion, and somebody not too long ago told me, you are a religious man. I said, why are you calling me names? Don't call me names. I'm not religious. He said, oh, you look very religious. I said, I'm not religious. I'm a God-fearing Jew. I follow the Torah. Don't call me religious. And I told you the story. I mentioned it so many times when I saw this young man that on the street approached another man and he asked him if he wants to put filin on. And the older man answered him, I'm not religious. And the young man was telling him, do you want to put filin on? And he answered him again, but I'm not religious. And the young man said again, do you want to put filin on? And he's answering, I'm not religious. The young man was not asking him if he's religious. He asked him if he wants to put filin on. And he associated that filin with religion and said, I'm not religious. So really, following the Torah has nothing to do with religion. I don't like the word even religion. It's not even a biblical word. You don't even find the word in the Torah, religious or religion. It doesn't say the word dat. This is an invention that came way, way after we got the Torah. We are Jews. We're actually more, to be, to be more correct, we are the sons of Israel. We're the Bnei Israel. Even the word Jew is not in the Torah. The word Jew came after the second exile. They started calling us Jew. Yeah, we're Bnei Israel. We're the sons of Israel. I wouldn't say uh, Hebrew, because that was at the time of Abraham Avino, the Ivrim. So up until today, certain people consider themselves Ivrim, but they're not Jewish. But the thing is that the first anti-Semite, Amani Machshimo, he didn't like the fact that our religion is different. So the thing is that we want to know why everybody hates us. And more than that, how can I change that? I don't want to be hated. I travel all the time. When I you know, walk around airports, I see everybody looking at me and I see the hate. And unfortunately, half of them, they hate me because they don't even know why they hate me. They hate me because they told them Jews drink the blood of, of, of non-Jews and all sorts of myths and all sorts of things. And you know, believe it or not, even in North America, you'll still find it in different states. Somebody once met me and they, they, they told me, are you Jewish? Are you a Jew? And it was in Virginia. And I was like, yeah. And, and they were like, but where's your horns? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, my horns. My horns are at home on my bookshelf where I blow them on Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, to buy, to hide, to hide the horns. So unfortunately, it's just a misconception. <clears throat> now, this is a whole different uh, thing, which is off the topic. But unfortunately, a big part of the hate that is towards us is because of us, and we create this hate. This is a different problem, but this is off the subject. But really, most of the people hate us. And it's not a problem with a self-image. It's not that I have a self low self-esteem. That's the reality. Most of the world do hate the Jews, which I believe that very easily half of it can be corrected like that with the right uh, approach and the right attitude and the right uh, uh, way of presenting who we are. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the Jews, they make, they, they create this hate. <clears throat> and it's very, very bad. It's actually something that bothered me from the first day that I became observant, that most <clears throat> of the observant Jews in the diaspora, they behave in such a disgusting way towards the non-Jews that it creates hate. And, and it's wrong. And it's mamash chilul Hashem. It's desecrating the name of Hashem. And I, unfortunately, I didn't see a lot of religious Jews that behave nice towards the non-Jews. And that also creates hate. So I would say that easily 50% of the hate towards us is done because of us. We're just not behaving nice. 
needless to say how Israelis behave outside of the country. It is a disgrace. I told you, now when I went to England, I saw this unbelievable thing. The, the plane had a bumper sticker. I was going on the plane, and, and it had a sticker on the plane. You know, the, 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 how do you call it? The terminal, but it has like this, the arm where you go onto the plane. It covers a little bit the plane, but you see a little bit around the plane, and it had a sticker. I never saw such a thing. And it said, it was uh, uh, the Israeli airline, El Al, and it says, in abroad, you represent the country. Please behave appropriately. And I was like, wow, look at that. Look at a cool bumper sticker on the plane of El Al. And I was like, because the Israelis, in most cases, don't behave nice abroad. Hey, you know, they're loud, they're vulgar, throw things on the floor. I'm not talking about they destroy rooms and hotels. And, uh, and stealing things and Shemirachem. So unfortunately, a lot of the hate towards us is because of us. And it's up to us to change it. But there is another type of hate that we don't understand why. And this hate came down when we got the Torah. The mountain that we received the Torah is called Mount Sinai, Har Sinai. Why? Because hate came down to the world. And the hate came down to the world because we're not doing something right. And, and in this parasha, it's actually pointing it out. So we want to know, A, why is everybody hating us? And B, what we can do to solve it. And more than that, I want to understand what is my purpose in life. My purpose is not necessarily to fulfill the mitzvahs and to learn Torah. That's my way of life. But also the non-Jews have to follow the Torah and they have mitzvot. So therefore, we're not different. Now, interestingly, the hint that we find that makes us a separated nation is that the prophecy, the word goes, Hen Am Levadishkon. Hen. Hen is a very weird word. It's not even a word. It doesn't have much of a meaning. Hen Am. Now, the word Hen, which is really not a word. You don't use this word for any type of context. But it has the letter He and it has the letter Nun. These letters are called Otiyot Shalomit Kabzot. The letters that cannot find a, a, a partner. Now, if you take the letters Aleph to Yud, each letter has a numerical value. Aleph is one, Bet is two, right? Gimel is three, till Yud, Yud is ten. If you take the ends, Aleph and Tet, would be 1 and 9, 1 and 9 is 10. Bet and Chet, 2 and 8, is 10. Gimel and Zayn, 7 and 3, is 10. The only one who doesn't have a partner is 5. 4 and 6, and then 5 is by itself. Right? Same thing with, uh, with between Yud and the end. Same thing you have, you take 10 and 90, it gives you 100. 10, 20 and 80 will give you 100. And 50 is by itself. If you take that digit and you times it the same number, you will get also, I mean, ten, 5 times 2 will be 10. 50 times 2 will be 100. But the hen, this word that doesn't make sense, is the hint that we're always going to be in the middle with no partner, so to say. <clears throat> so the prophecy said that we're always going to be segregated, we're always going to be separate. And the prophecy was said by Bilam. Now first we have to understand who's Bilam. Bilam, he's known as Bilam ben Beor. And he was a prophet. And you know, they say that he was a greater prophet than Moshe Rabbeinu. First of all, the non-Jews always had prophets that nobody can come and say that from the nations, hey, if you would give us prophets, we would also be good. So she made sure that always the nations also have prophets. But when, uh, when we want to know exactly who Bil'am was, there's a Midrash that says that Moshe Rabbeinu, Bil'am was such a great prophet that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote a book about Bil'am. That there's a six book that Moshe wrote. I mean, we have the five books of Moses. But one, there's actually six books that one book Moshe Rabbeinu wrote about Bil'am. And Bil'am was a very, very big prophet. It says about Moshe Rabbeinu, "Vlo kam od navi be Israel ke Moshe." 
when they ask a question, why do you say Be Israel? Say, Lo kam navi ke Moshe. There was never a prophet like, the, like Moshe. Why you have to add the word Be Israel? So the commentary, you can find it in the Midrash, where that is called Sifri. He says, yeah, Be Israel. But out of Israel, there's greater prophets. And we learn from that that Bilam was a greater prophet than Moshe Rabbeinu. Be Israel, in the nation of Israel, nobody, no come Navi Ke Moshe. There was never a greater prophet than Moshe. But out of the nation of Israel, yeah, there was a greater prophet, and that was Bilam. <coughs> Shlomo HaMelech says, Zelu Matze Bara Elokim. Hashem created everything with an opposition, with something that is equal to it. In order to make the world equal, it wouldn't be fair if on the positive side it will be more powerful than the negative side. In order for it to be equal, it has to be what's called Zelu Matze, one across the other. So the Leumatze of Moshe Rabbeinu is Bilam. As great as Moshe Rabbeinu was, not only as a prophet, he got us out of Egypt, he brought us the Torah, he spoke to Hashem face to face. Bilam was in that level. So some will argue that, that Bilam was a greater prophet than Moshe Rabbeinu. Some will say, no, he was just as good. But Bilam was a pretty serious prophet. Now, we first learn about Bilam in the parasha that is called Shmot. When Paro saw that something is uh, changing. He gave only 70 visas to Yaakov and his family. He only issued 70 green cards. He's, he's like, I didn't give green cards to millions of people. I only allowed these 70 people to come into my country because of Yosef. I only issued 70 green cards. And a few hundred years later, suddenly there are millions. And, more, and Paro says, listen, we're going to have a problem here. They're multiplying here like, like in, in huge numbers. What's going to be very soon if they're going to go against us? They're going to become an uh, enemy. What should we do? So Paro had three advisors. Yitro, Eyov, and Bilam. And each one of these advisors said something. Yitro said, listen, don't mess with them. Don't mess with them. Anyone who messed with them suffered. Your great-great-great-grandfather that tried to mess with Sarah... He, he got punished. So learn, don't mess with this nation. When Avimelech also tried to mess a little bit with Avram Avinu, there was a problem. When Avram Avinu went to Mitzrayim and they took Sarah, don't mess with him. So Itro was a mensch and he told him, I, I suggest to you, being your advisor, don't do anything. Therefore, later on, Itro had the merit to convert Needless to say that later on he had the merit that he became the father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu. But he had later on had the merit to convert. And more than that, his, his generations became very, very special. They sat in the Beit HaMikdash, in Lishkat HaGazit. He got a very strong lineage. The other advisor, who was Eyov, who was known as Job, he didn't say anything. He was neutral, part, like in the United Nations. One of them, you know, they don't say anything. So, and he got punished severely. He had to go through a life full of Yesurim. And the third advisor was Bilam. And Bilam said, make them slaves. Because you are afraid of them multiplying. You don't want them to become a big nation. Make them slaves. And they're not going to have any energy to procreate. They're going to come home at 12 o'clock at night. You think they'll want to be with their wife. They'll just want to go to sleep. Make them slaves. That was the advice of Bilam. Therefore, later on, his, his, his uh, punishment was penalty of death. They killed him. Bnei Israel, they killed, killed, him, killed him in the war. So, <clears throat> another question that comes is, where does Bil'am have the power to curse? I mean, after all, he, he was a prophet, but how did he know how to curse? How did he know how to use his mouth? That's a pretty s severe thing. So the Gemara in the Tractate of Sanhedrin explains that Bilam knew exactly the moments in the universe. And every second in the universe is a different energy. There's a story about the Balatanya 
that when he was in jail, you know the story, he was in jail for spreading Hasidut, and while he was in jail, he had a personal visit by the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid from Azrej that came to his uh, cell. Later on, when they checked the cell, they found that three people cannot even be in the size of the cell. But the story says that the king at the time uh, heard about the power of this man. They told him this is not a simple individual. So he said, I want to test really his powers and I want to meet him. So he suggested, turn the light off in his, room, in his cell. Give him a couple of days without light, he, a normal human being would lose track of time. Now when we, we don't even notice it, but we have some type of a balance in our life because we see lights, dark, light, dark, so we know what's going on. Take a person, put him in a dark room for three, four days, he would lose track of time. He won't, he won't know what time it is. So that's what they did with the, with the Balatanya. They, they turned the lights off. Now, when the king came after a couple of days, it was 10 to 2 in the afternoon. So as he opens the door, the Balatanya stands up because there is a halakha that you have to stand in front of a king. It doesn't matter who the king is, even if he's a wicked king, you still have to stand. So, and more than that, there's a certain bracha that you say when you see a king. So the king told him, well, how come you stood up? And what is this sentence that you said? So he answered him, you have, we have to stand in front of a king. And the sentence that I said is a certain blessing that you say in front of a king. So he told him, how do you know I'm a king? You don't know me. There's no newspapers. There's no internet. How do you know how the king looks? How do you know who I am even? So he told him, every person in the world has a minister in the heavens trillions of angels for every person there's one angel but when a very special person a minister or a king or a general there's a very special minister in Shemaim when you walked in I was able to see the minister that escorts you and I saw that it's a very serious angel I understood you are a king so he tells him why aren't you sleeping it's 10 to 2 at night so he says no it's not it's 10 to 2 in the afternoon he tells him, how do you know what time is it? So he says, every moment in the universe has a certain energy. And every hour of the day has a certain power. A certain combination of the words of the, of the word of the name of Hashem Yudke Vavke. There are 24 combinations how you can switch the letters around. And every hour of the day there's a different combination in the name of Hashem of Yudke Vavke. And I saw, I know, I can see the combination. This is what's called, it's called Tziruf Otiyot. I don't know if combination is the right word, but, com but combining the words in a different order. And he says, I see the Tziruf Otiyot of Yudke Vavke, I know what time it is. So of course, the, he understood very, very quickly, this is not a simple person, this is not a regular individual. But the point is that Bilam knew those times. He, he had some type of a Ruach HaKodesh. This is brought down in the tractate Sanhedrin in the Talmud. That that's how he knew. He knew what's called Itim, the moments of the day. And he knew when is the moment when Hashem is a little bit upset. A, that the attribute of judgment is in the most powerful. What's called Midat Adin. Because every second of the day there's a different Midah that is more empowered. And there's a certain hour of the day that Midat Adin, the attribute of the judgment, is the most, most severe. And this is the most, most harsh time of the day. Now, he knew that. Not only that, he knew when we're kind of upsetting Hashem. And he knew when Hashem is a little bit upset. Now, not that Hashem is moody and sometimes he's upset and sometimes he's happy. But Hashem is operating through his Midot, through his attributes. And he knew exactly when is the sensitive time to to come and put a prosecution. It's like, you know, my kids, I'm sure it's like this in every household, but my kids are normal kids, Baruch Hashem, and kids, they, they, uh, they tattletale. That's how you say, tattletale? They snitch. And when one kid is about to get in trouble, his uh, system 
to get out of trouble is to say, but the other one also did this and that. <laughs> like as if, oh, because the other one is also wrong, then I'm going to give more mercy to you. <laughs> Yesterday I came, we had a bar of chocolate in the fridge, and I came out, who had the bar of chocolate? <laughs> Everybody's looking for stars. Suddenly they're looking for the cobwebs on the wall. So I'll, I right away see who took the chocolate. So I approached the one, I told him, why did you take the chocolate? But you know, the other one took yesterday from, from the cake. I didn't ask you what the other one do. This is not an interrogation. I asked you why you took it. So the little kids, they try to get their way out by pointing a finger at somebody else. So, and this is not only kids, by the way, also adults, they get in trouble, they... To get the, the spotlight off of them, they point on somebody else. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so Bilam, Bilam knew when to put a prosecution on. To say, oh, look, they did something. He knew when is the right time when Hashem is not 100% happy. So going back to the analogy with my kids, if two of the kids fight, but oh Hashem, my kids are normal, they fight, they're normal kids. Uh, some people tell me, oh my kids are such good kids, they never fight. I tell them, they're not good, they're, something's not normal if they don't fight. <laughs> so you should be worried. The good kids, normal kids, they fight, they argue, they, they, they don't like each other. That's normal kids. If your kids don't fight, you, something's wrong with them. It's too much retalin. You gotta get them off the retalin if they don't fight. So, so, my kids know that if they fight or something, they know when I'm not in the best mood, so to say, to come and say something about the other one. They'll wait for the right moment to say, oh, Abba's now a little bit upset, even though I don't get upset. But they know the right moments, when is a good time to, to say something about the other kid. Or, on the positive note, they know when to come and ask for money, when to ask for the big, pre the expensive present. So they know that will be a etraton, an auspicious time to come and say, you know, my birthday is in a month, and I really want this a very expensive present. So kids are very sensitive. They know when is the good time to approach the parent and when is the bad time to approach the parent. Same thing was Bilam. Bilam know when is the right time to approach Hashem and to put a prosecution. So it's not that he had special powers to curse, rather he knew when is the right time. This is what the, the Talmud explains to us. And the point is that he found that he can't really curse us. Hashem manipulated it in such a way that he couldn't curse us. So his solution, like I told you, he told, send the girls, dress them in miniskirts, they, they'll, they'll and make a big cleavage, and send them to seduce the boys that's where they're going to fail. They're not going to be able to, to hold the temptation. And that's what happened. And next week we're going to read about it, that the, the head, the president, the Nasi of one of the tribes failed with a, a girl from Midian to a point that uh, there had to be a first legal biblical murder. We're going to learn about it next week, about Pinchas. I mean, it's all starting in this parasha. But it's, it actually, it's actually happening in this parasha. But next week we're going to talk about it. Even though it has to do with this parasha. But that's, that's what was the solution at the end. So now we, we come back to the question, why the nations hate us? It has to be something that is igniting their hate. And we have to prevent that. We have to stop that. There was only one period in history when the nations were good with us. And that when, was, when King Solomon was the king. When Shlomo Amelech built Bet HaMikdash, one of the many reasons why his name is Shlomo is because Shlomo comes from the word Shalom, peace. And while he was king, there was peace in the world. The nations were friends with us, they accepted us, they came to the holy temple to sacrifice their offerings, and everything was good. And we have to bring that back. Last week, if you remember, on Tuesday in the class that we had about the vision of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and I said that for 3,000 years we're missing our call. 
and that we're segregating ourselves from the nations. And not only that, that we're taking the Torah and saying, I don't want to share it. It doesn't matter right now, even though the Torah was given to us in Mount Sinai, but it wasn't for keeps. It's, it wasn't a present just for us. It was given to us to give it over to the nations. And nobody can come and claim ownership on, on the Torah. The Torah belongs to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. It was given to the Jews to learn it and then to give it over to the nations. That's why it was given to us. But with something that we're failing for so many years, and that's one of the major reasons why we have this hate. Now, really, many can argue on the fact by what I'm saying, the Torah doesn't belong to us. Yes, it was given to us. It was given to us to learn it and to fulfill it but mainly to teach it, to give it over. And the reality is that the non-Jews have a portion in the Torah. The Torah is also belongs to them too. If you remember, we mentioned it a couple times, before we got the Torah, before Mount Sinai, we were offered seven mitzvot, and we applied by saying, Na seven ishma. We would listen, we would do, and then we would listen. This is a very famous quote, Na'asev and Ishma, but this Na'asev and Ishma goes on the seven laws of Noah. So when we accepted the mitzvot, and we all pride in saying we, we didn't ask questions, we just took it, we only did that for seven mitzvot. A week later, when we got another 606 mitzvot, we were like, whoa, I said yes to seven, not to 606. <laughs> so when we were all, uh, you know, a, a very uh, determined and we were like now seven ishmana says we'll do we're not going to ask any questions that goes on the seven laws of noah a week later we got another 616 mitz 606 mitzvot and then we were like okay we're not a hundred percent sure that we want them and the kadosh Baruch Hu said if you accept now the torah then good you're going to accept it you'll take it you'll live but if you don't accept the torah this is going to be your burial place. Here you're going to die. So really, we only accepted seven, not the other 606. So these seven mitzvot that we accepted, they're for everybody. These are called the seven laws of Noah. And also the nations, they're obligated in keeping them. So really, when it comes to fulfilling the mitzvot, there's no difference between me and the non-Jew. The non-Jew is also obligated in doing the mitzvot. And you know that, Jew, that the non-Jews can, they don't have to. But they can fulfill all the mitzvot like a Jew besides two, which is actually one. So the non-Jew can do 611 mitzvot. You know a non-Jew can put filin on. There's no prohibition. There's no prohibition for a non-Jew to put filin on. It doesn't say a non-Jew is not allowed to put filin on. A non-Jew can wear tzitzit. A non-Jew can follow the laws of, of kosher. A non-Jew can do everything that we do but Shabbat. Shabbat. That's why it's two mitzvot, because Shabbat is a positive mitzvah and a negative mitzvah. Shamor was a whole. So technically, a non-Jew can do 611 mitzvot. Even learning Torah, by the way. Many people say, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, a non-Jew is not allowed to learn Torah. It's wrong. If the non-Jew is learning Torah just for the knowledge and for the fun, he's allowed to. He's not allowed to learn Torah in order to do it. That's when the non-Jews are not allowed to learn. So when people come and say, how, how are you teaching Torah to non-Jews? It's not allowed. It's not allowed for them to learn Torah in order to do. We have to learn Lilmod al Menat Lasot. To, to, to learn in order to do. That's prohibited for a non-Jew. But for a Jew to sit in a class and to learn the beauty in the Torah, there's no problem. He can learn. But he's not allowed to learn in order to do. That's a big difference. So the only mitzvah that a non-Jew is not allowed to do is Shabbat. Why? Why is the non-Jew not allowed to, to celebrate Shabbat? So, a non-Jew is allowed to rest. And the non-Jews, they have a day of rest, Sunday. A non-Jew is not allowed to rest for the sake of resting. This is Shabbat. The resting on Shabbat is for the sake of resting. This is the minor detail that the non-Jew is allowed to rest. You want to rest in order to have energy to work? Go ahead. You can have it on Thursday, you can have it on Sunday, do whatever day. You want two days? Get take two days. But not for the sake of resting. 
A non-Jew is not allowed to rest for the sake of resting, which is called Shabbat. This is called Rishbot. On Shabbat, we rest for the sake of resting, not because I'm tired. So, <clears throat> we even know that there were periods in history that there were pillars in our, our nation, they were very good friends with non-Jews. You know that Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, he's known as Rebbe, you don't call him by his name, but he's Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, he's the, the, the sage that compiled the oral Torah, the Mishnah. One of his best friends was an, an, Antitos, Antino, Antinin, Ant, Antininus, who was a, a Caesar. They were best friends. And not only they were best friends, you know, they were born on the same day and on the same hour. And they were good friends. And the story, there's a story in the, in the, in the Talmud, in Tractate Shabbat, that says that one time he came to visit him on Shabbat. And Rebbe was very sad because he gave, couldn't give him food. They didn't have a blech, they didn't have a pot of chuns, and the food was cold, the fish was cold, everything was cold. And, and Antininus came to visit him on Shabbat and he wanted to give him food, so everything that he gave him was cold. And uh, Rebbe was very, he wasn't so comfortable. Later on, Antino, uh, Antininus told him, one time when he invited him to, for a meal during the week, he said, you know, the food you gave me on Shabbat was much better. Better, it was cold. He said, no, you put some spice in it that made it taste amazing. What's the spice that you put in the food that you gave me? Even though it was cold, it was amazing. So Rabbi told him, this spice is called Shabbat. And this was food from Shabbat. So, we know in many times in history that there was a close relationship between a, a Jew and a non-Jew. And there's nothing wrong with having a good relationship with the nations. I have many friends. I have a very good friend. He's a non-Jew. He's a very good friend. I'm sorry to say that. He's much better than many other Jews that I met in everything. Charitable and kind and honest and polite and really very, very special man. So really, we don't have much difference between the non-Jews. To a point that they can fulfill the Torah. And actually, they're actually obligated. They have to fulfill seven laws of Noah, which is actually 70 mitzvot. The only thing that is a non-Jew that is allowed, it's, it's seven titles. But when you dissect the titles, then it is broken into about 70 mitzvot. If you want to really see, go on my website. The, 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 I have one place, I wrote like an article that it says the seven titles, but the subcategories of each title, you get to 70 mitzvot. So non-Jews, they, you know, they have to fill their part in the Torah. And the sad reality is that till they'll start doing it, we're, going, we're not going to have the redemption. The redemption is, is depending on the non-Jews too. <coughs> That's what I spoke last Tuesday, that we can't say it's up to us. It is up to us, but it's also up to us to educate the non-Jews to do their part so they can also be part of the redemption. So... <coughs> There is a question, why is a non-Jew not allowed to observe Shabbat? At the end of the day, we're not separate from, from the non-Jews. It says, Betzelem Elohim Nivra Avdam, in the image of God, man was created. The non-Jews are also created in the image of God. There's no difference. I'm not talking right now on the structure of the Neshama. A non-Jew also has a Nefesh and a Ruach. We have a Neshama, a Yechida, and a Chayatu. A non-Jew has a nefesh and a ruach. That's in the spiritual level the difference. But in the physical level, our bodies are identical. Even though my, one can argue, they find the DNA, the difference, whatever. No need to go into the small details here. But there is an argument, why is a non-Jew not allowed to observe Shabbat? And the, 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 the Talmud is talking about it. And you can find it in the Tractate of Sanhedrin. And it says that the non-Jew is not a, the, the purpose of a non-Jew is to develop the world. This is the purpose of the non-Jew, to develop this world, to bring down wisdom into the world, to bring, uh, I mean, this is not the word that the, the Talmud is talking about, but in our terminology, to bring technology, to bring medicine, to bring wisdom into the world. This is the purpose of the non-Jew. Of the non-Jew. The non-Jew non is here to develop the world. Therefore, 
they're, they're, they're technically in the spiritual level, they don't need to uh, have a break in order to rest for the sake of resting. You want to rest for your body, take a vacation. Make yourself a vacation day, a resting day. That's why the non-Jews said, okay, we'll do Sunday. Sunday will be the resting day. There's nothing wrong with that. But in regards to their peula, to their action, their action, which is huge to society and to the universe, they have to develop the world. That's their purpose. The non-Jew is a totally different purpose, and we'll get to it in a second. But the non-Jew has a different purpose. And I heard a beautiful story that kind, kind of emphasizes what's our purpose. About 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, there was a woman, a Jewish woman, that learned in a university in France. And in her studies, she met uh, a, a rabbi who started to teach her about her Judaism. And in the course of the studies, he taught her about the mitzvah of mezuzah. And he, she really liked it. Now, she lived in a very big building in France. I don't know where, it doesn't really matter. But she liked it so much, she went and hung a mezuzah on her doorpost. But she was a pretty bold thing. In Europe, after the Holocaust, who puts a mezuzah on their door? And after a while, people started telling her about the mezuzah. Listen, you know, we're not too far from the Holocaust. People still hate the Jews. <coughs> It's not maybe not so, so much the right thing to do. And she was convinced to remove the mezuzah. One day somebody knocks on her door and tells her, where's your mezuzah? She's like, what? He tells her, where's the mezuzah? Why'd you take it off? So she told him why she he took it off. And he told her, listen, I gotta tell you something. I'm Jewish. And I, 30 years ago, I, I am a Holocaust survivor. I was in the camps. And after seeing my family brutally murdered in front of my eyes, and after going through the, the horrors in the Holocaust, I went, uh, uh, you know, I, against Hashem. I, and I grew up uh, observant, by the way. But I went war with the Kadosh Bafo. And I said, if he exists, then how dare he do something like that? And if he doesn't exist, and something like this can happen, so what, what am I worshipping? <coughs> something that doesn't exist? Therefore, I'm head to head. No God. And for 30 years, I live my life, there's no God. And if he is, does exist, I don't want to be part of him. So, careful with the camera. Uh, see, you just moved it. So, uh, <clears throat> and then he says that three weeks ago, the elevator was broken, and I had to walk up the stairs. And I'm walking up the stairs, and I find suddenly come to the fourth floor, which I will never stop on the fourth floor. And you know what do I see? A mezuzah. And you know what it made for me? I remembered when I was a little kid, my mom used to pick me up to make me kiss the mezuzah. And I suddenly remembered my mom. Oh, wow. And every time I went up, I suddenly remembered something. And I remembered my father, that when he used to take me out of the synagogue, he would pick me up to kiss the mezuzah and pray to Hashem that I should be safe. And every time I would come up the stairs, I would see the mezuzah and I remembered one of my family, <laughs> one of my family members. I know we need tissues. I also need a tissue. So, and he said that every time I would see the mezuzah, it would remind me one of my family members. And it finally reminded me that I'm a Jew and there is a God. And now you took the mezuzah off? How dare you take this mezuzah off? This mezuzah is reminding me of, my, of that I'm a Jew. And needless to say that the mezuzah went back on the wall very fast. And when I heard the story besides the tears, it made me realize our purpose as Jews is to advertise godliness in the world. This is our purpose. 
The purpose of a non-Jew is to develop the world, to bring wisdom into the world, to bring technology, to bring medicine, to, to do huge things, to, 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 to create something in this world. This is the purpose of a non-Jew. Even though the Jewish mind, yes, we have many Nobel Prizes, and we have many big uh, inventions came from Jews, fine. But it's the power and the purpose of the non-Jew to develop and to bring prosperity and wisdom and, and great inventions into the world. The Jews' purpose is to publicize there's a God in the world. That's it. This is our purpose. Not to learn Torah, not to fulfill the mitzvahs. I'm not I'm telling you not to learn Torah, not to fulfill mitzvahs. We have to because that's how we advertise, hello, there's a God in the world. Somebody created the world. That's our purpose. And since we are failing in our purpose, that's why the nations hate us. Because they're looking up to us and we're not fulfilling our part of the deal. They're fulfilling their purpose. They're creating beautiful things, technology, computers, satellites, rockets, whatever it is. Rockets can be something negative, but rockets are also positive things. They send the, the satellites out to space to be able to have unbelievable technology with these satellites. Anything can be used to something negative. The internet also can be used to something negative. But on the other hand, it can be used to something beyond positive. I can sit here and learn Torah. And you know how many thousands of people watching the classes? Thousands. Thousands. Rabbi Akiva didn't have such a, a following. Can you imagine if Rabbi Akiva had a Facebook page? He would have thousands of followers. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai didn't have a YouTube channel. And I'm a simple person and I have thousands of people watching my Torah from the power of the internet. So anything negative can be looked at, anything can be pushed to, to, to be directed to something negative, but the purpose is for the non-Jew is to create things in this world, and my purpose is to advertise godliness in the world. And when I don't do my purpose, then the nations will hate me. So we find that my purpose in the world is to advertise the existence of God. How? By doing the mitzvot. By being different. By stopping on one day on, on the week, on Shabbat, that everybody will tell me, why can't you travel? Shabbat. There's a creator to the world. When now when I was missing, when I missed my flight in England, they told me, why can't you fly on Shabbat? Why can't I book you the flight at nine at night? Shabbat. I can't make it. I can't drive. Why? There's a creator to the world. It's not for me to rest, it's to show that there's a creator to the world. Why are you putting tefillin on? Because there's a creator to the world. Why eating kosher? Why I, as a non-Jew, can eat big and you can't? Because there's a creator to the world. And I came to show you that there's a creator to the world. The difference between a Jew and a non-Jew, a non-Jew came to this world to give life. A Jew is to explain how, what is the purpose of life? How to live my life. This is the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew. Non-Jew came here to give life, to bring life to the world. But the non-Jew is going to come and tell you what's the purpose of life. How to live your life the right way. A non-Jew came to the world to tell you how to live. Eat healthy, exercise, whatever it is. But the non-Jew will come and teach you why to live. Because there's a God. There's an afterlife. You have a soul. This is the difference between the Jew and the non-Jew. When we're not fulfilling our purpose, the non-Jews don't like us. A Jew will respect a non-Jew. Will respect a Jew when the Jew respects himself. When we're not fulfilling our mission, the nations don't like us. Now, they don't see it. It's not that it's a, something that's written on the wall. They just feel it. Now if I come down to this world and I'm not observing Shabbat, not because I need to observe Shabbat for myself, I need to observe Shabbat to say there's a God in the world. When I, as a Jew, come down to the world and I'm not fulfilling my obligation, the non-Jew looks at me and he says, I don't like you. I'm doing my part, you're not, you're not doing your part. You are here to tell me the purpose of life. You know that the biggest, or maybe the second biggest publisher, book publisher in the world and distributor is Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble says 
that the second most desired topic in the world is Kabbalah. Millions and millions and millions of non-Jews, they learn Kabbalah. They want the purpose. They say, I know how to live my life. I have health, medicine, I know everything. I need a purpose. I have the, the secret. The non-Jew is going to tell you, I know how to live. This is the, the non-Jew will come and tell you, I know how to create life, how to make, to, to live life. The Jew is like, I know the purpose. And so forth. The non-Jew will tell you how to live. The Jew will, will tell you why to live. So when I'm not doing it, the non-Jew hates me. You're not doing your purpose. You're not inspiring me. You're not putting, you're not letting me come closer to the master of the universe. So I have to make on my own God. You're not letting, giving me access to the real God. No problem. I'll make myself an own God. Don't come and complain that I'm an idol worshiper. So we are failing as a nation for 3,300 and something years because we're not showing to the world what we're supposed to do. And then we complain that everybody hates us. So that's why I said before that 50% can be blamed on our behavior. I mean, I used to live in America how the religious people treat the non-Jewish people. There's a disgrace. A disgrace. It's, it's, it's embarrassing. I would walk in religious neighborhood and I would be embarrassed how my brothers and sisters are behaving. The guy. And all sorts of, you know, <laughs> sayings like that. So that's 50% of the hate, but the other 50% is the non just say, hey, you not, you're not pulling your weight. You're not inspiring me. You're not teaching me the purpose of life. I have to go like this and like that to start finding it out. More than that, 90% of the Jews are not observant. I'm not doing my purpose. I'm not eating kosher, I'm not observing Shabbat, I'm not keeping the laws of family purity and so forth. The non Jews is saying, hey, you're not doing your job. You're not hanging your mezuzah. You're not telling me that there's a God in the world that I have to go down to invent a God. So this parasha comes to teach us a very basic but very deep concept that yes, we are a little bit different than the nations, but we're different in our purpose. Spiritually we're different, but we can't look at ourselves as different that we're better, that we're superior. When it says the, the chosen nation, it's not because we have nicer eyes. We were chosen to inspire the rest of the nations. We were selected by Hashem. You should be for me a nation of priests, holy people, that show the world spirituality, and Goy Kadosh. Goy is a body. That's the, the translation of the word Goy. Goy is a body. That's why, why, the, why God, God is a body. I explained to you many times that Adam Arishon, Adam, was an ashama, was a soul, it wasn't a body. All the souls of all the world, Jews and non-Jews, came from the soul of Adam Arishon. The souls of the Jews came from his head. That's where we call the Bnei Israel. Israel, Israel, if you switch the letters around, is Lirosh. Lirosh is my head. And the non-Jews, we call them Goim, because a body in Hebrew is Gviah. This is a corpse, a body is Gvia. So Goy is a body. So Hashem says, you will be a nation of priests, the Goy Kadosh, a holy body. How are you going to make yourself holy? Don't eat these types of animals. And go and bathe in a mikveh. And do this and do that. Your body will be holy. So, the meaning and the message behind this parasha is that our main purpose in the world is to advertise godliness. Is to carry our, I don't like saying the word Judaism because this is already associated with religion, but our Jewishness. We'll use the word Judaism just for the sake of the example. We have to carry our Judaism proudly. And now I know it's much easier in Israel to put a mezuzah, but in, even outside of Israel. I mean, now it's a little bit easier. But you know what? I was now in London I'm walking on the street to go into a lecture. A guy comes to me and he's like, Hey, I remember you, I remember you. You gave a lecture in Ranana a few months ago. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, ah, oh, what are you doing here? I told him, I'm walking to this shul now. I'm going to give a lecture. I told him, why don't you come? And he's like, okay. I, you know, I'm going to come. I liked your lecture then. I'm going to walk in. And then he tells me, and look. I even have my yarmulke in my pocket. And he pulls out his yarmulke. 
I told him, a, I told him, are you proud of the fact that your yarmulke is in the pocket? What do you mean? I even have my yarmulke in my pocket. I told him, why? You should be ashamed that your yarmulke is in the pocket. He's like, no, you know, everybody told me it's dangerous here in London, and uh, I don't want to walk with a yarmulke here to be noticed as a Jew. I told him, I'm very sorry to tell you, Mr. Goldstein, <laughs> your nose. Pretty Jewish. The yarmulke doesn't give in your Jewishness. You look like a Jew. I'm sorry to tell you. So, the fact is that many people, they they in places like London, you know, I was invited now to give a couple lectures in Paris. Everybody said, "Oh, don't go there. It's very dangerous." I said, oh, "Well, dangerous. Hashem uh, is with me. If I'm supposed to go somewhere, I will go there." And more, I'm not going to put my yarmulke on because it's a dangerous place. I know people, they go to Morocco with their yarmulke on. The point is that we have a purpose as Jews and our purpose is to advertise the name of God. And the more we do it, we're more fulfilling our purpose. And the more we do it the right way, the more the nations are, 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 are going to respect us. When we don't respect ourselves as a nation, the non-Jews will not respect us because a, Jew, a non-Jew will respect a Jew that respects himself. And if I treat other people disgusting, especially when I look like this, you know that now in America every second day you find out a horrible, horrible news. Every second, third day another molester pops up. Now there's this whole big thing going on in New Jersey. Dozens of Orthodox people from New Jersey are arrested by the FBI for this multi-million dollar scam against government funds. Every second day something is popping up. The whole newspapers and the internet in New Jersey about... I uh, don't no need to talk too much Lashon Allah about it. But it's, just, it's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Here a minister embezzles millions of dollars. Here a rabbi cheats. Here this... And the non-Jews are looking at us and saying, oh, What are you doing? You are the ones who are supposed to lead us. You are, you are a disgrace. And now we don't understand why people hate us. We bring 99% of the anti-Semite, we bring it on ourselves. So our purpose is to advertise the name of God, not to be embarrassed by who we are. And we are, as Jews, we, we are, have to, and we are obligated in fulfilling the mitzvot, because we, through the mitzvot, we show showing to the nations, there is a God.